more minutes. I defend my thesis on Monday. <laughs> I don't know how many people here know that. <laughs> I'm like super nervous and excited, but this talk is like such good practice. So yeah, ask me anything. Like I am so, I just need, I just want to make sure I, you know, share this work in the best way on Monday, you know? So like, I really love the work and it's just really cool to be able to kind of talk about it finally with like, I would say my community, which is like all over like the US and Canada. Like people are calling in from everywhere and it's so great because you're all like my family. It's amazing. Sorry, I'm being mushy. I know <laughs> it's one of those days. Yeah. Um, I don't know, if Sarah, should we just get going? I know people are yeah. gonna keep coming in. But like we're recording and if they miss the beginning, they can always Definitely. tune in. Yeah, we can start. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Sara Muzaffari uh, and I hope you are all doing well during this uncertain pandemic time. And uh, I'm one of the directors at Turding Studio Gallery. Turding is a newly established uh, artist-run gallery based in Markham, Ontario. And it is committed to supporting emerging artists and it encourages work that engages critically with a wide range of contemporary discourses. We offer exhibition space and artist residences to the local, national and international emerging artists. And we are honored to have our third exhibition, Stories Held in a Time Traveler's Hogan by artist Nicole and Niles Hart. <laughs> she holds a BFA from the University of Victoria and is currently working on her MFA at Oket uh, University in Toronto. Uh, unfortunately, as you all know, as a response to the effects of COVID-19 on public spaces, engagements and gatherings, gatherings we weren't able to uh, have the show open to the public. Still, we decided to organize an artist talk to give the community a chance to gain an insight uh, into the artist's work. I stop talking now and ask Nicole to talk more about herself, her practice, specifically about her MFA thesis exhibition at Thursday. Nicole? <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thank you so much for having me in this space. Like truly you guys you're gonna see I like took over the space Sarah let me paint the walls which like is awesome. <laughs> and um, I just was really supported and kind of making this exhibition something that really reflected the like dreams that I had for it. And I'm just really grateful to you Sarah for letting me be here. My so. pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, so Yate, Nicole Neidhart, Yanashia, Kiaani Neshle, Bilagana Bashishin, Do Senejene Dasha Che, Do Bilagana Dasha Nala. Hi, everybody. I'm Nicole. Um, I have just learned how to introduce myself in Navajo in the last couple of years and have been, you know, really practicing that as much as I can. So I just kind of introduced my name and my clans. Um, I'm Danette, or you might know my nation better as the Navajo on my mom's side and a blend of European ancestry on my dad's side. Um, and I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is the traditional territory of the Tewa. Um, and then I did, yeah, as Sarah said, I did my undergrad at UVic on the Kongan territory and I'm currently calling you from Toronto, um, which is the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. And, you know, I'm just super grateful to be on these territories, to be near these waters. Um, they've really held me while I've been up here doing this uh, work. And it's just like such a privilege to be able to you know, take long walks through these territories, which I have been, and they've been really grounding. 
So a shahat to all of those who are constantly protecting and defending and fighting for this land and this territory. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be giving a little tour of my exhibition. Um, I figured it'd be more fun to just be in the space and talk about it and kind of show you guys what I made. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of start with that. Um, but to kind of welcome us into the space, I just wanted to read a little excerpt from my thesis document. Um, it's kind of how I welcome people into the document, and so I thought it might be a nice way to welcome people into this talk. Um, would you like to come into my celestial hogan? The bluebird song is twinkling, crystal clear in the early calm, but it's so chilly outside. Come in, the fire's hot and coffee's on. Sunbeams shine brightly as they peek over Cisna Jinna, White Shell Mountain. Light spills through the creases of the east facing door, carrying the most subtle caress of warmth. The earth is coated in frost. It's still winter. Fields of the tiniest cacti surround the Hogan, a circle of protection. The rest will be here any minute. The wind picks up outside as we prepare to listen to my thinking and making. Corn pollen prayers have been shared. The stories can be told now. And throughout my thesis document, I have these moments of just really grounding the reader in Navajo like territory and Navajo thinking, Navajo worldview. And kind of some of the ways I do that is bringing in some of these images that really make me think of home. So I thought that might be a nice way to start us off. Um, but let's get to it. Let me show you this exhibition. Um, I'm on my phone. So I thought I'd like really just be like, this is when you walk in. <laughs> This is on the right, you know, I hand painted my sign, stories held in a time traveler's hogan. And then if you turn to the left, this is my celestial hogan. Um, it was built by my little brother, Hayden, who is a rock star, <laughs> carpenter in training. <laughs> um, he built this structure back home in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he actually like <laughs> built it back home, disassembled it, labeled it so clearly. And then he uh, shipped it up to me and I put it together in the gallery. <laughs> so like pretty amazing support system for this work. Um, the structure I hand painted and there's like stars on it and if we go around, you can see that there are Dine time travelers hanging from this celestial Hogan. Um, and it's mirror mylar is super reflective. Um, it's like a plastic sheet. It moves with like the slightest touch or breath. Um, it's a really poetic material actually. And um, so within this mylar, I created these images of Diné time travelers. And they're all based on uh, people in my family. So this one is of my auntie Faith, who's like our matriarch in the family. She kind of keeps us all on track and always is looking out for us. And then this stencil here, is a self-portrait of me as a time traveler. And then over here, we'll go inside. This is my little brother, Hayden. And over here is my mom, Mary, white shell. I'll try and get good angles. It's really hard because it's very reflective, but you can see me. <laughs> And um, yeah, but also I guess I should tell you, if you don't know, a Hogan is a Navajo home. It's an eight-sided structure. So this one has eight sides. They always have a door that opens to the east. So this is east in this space. Um, 
And for this Hogan, I actually hand dyed uh, sand in order to match the earth back home from my home community in Round Rock, Arizona. And another beautiful feature of mylar is the light that kind of shimmers on the ground. And I'm kind of shaking it right now, but you can see how it kind of dances and glitters and it almost creates these patterns that are like light on water um, and just so reflective and so beautiful. Um, and just to kind of talk a little bit about the process of how I design these, um, I actually create them on my iPad. I work off of photos of, you know, in this case of my family. And then I think like really hard about like, what is the purpose of this Deneth time traveler? Like what are Deneth forms of time travel? Um, and I kind of coded those into each image. And when I'm creating designs like this, I'm really thinking a lot about my ancestors. I'm thinking about ancestor artists, which is a term that my primary supervisor, Peter Morin, who is Taltan, um, he taught me that term and it really opened up this ability to take time and visit with my ancestors and my ancestor artists and think about the design choices that they made and how I can make similar ones, but in my own kind of lived reality and context. Um, but then along with, you know, this kind of looking back, looking to the past and to my ancestors, I was really thinking about like, what are Danette aesthetics gonna be like in the future? Like, what will our patterns and designs look like in the future? And I really tried to kind of imagine into that space and into that world and infuse that in these designs as well. So it really is for me, I think about it as this blending of like past, present and future um, that these time travelers, like the designs that make them up, like that's where it comes from. And then, um, oh yeah. And also the reason I really love the sand is because it leaves traces of people's like footprints. So I don't know if you can see but there's like footprints from the few people who have been able to visit. <laughs> and that's been really like special just to have those traces kind of left behind. But if we kind of come out of the Hogan um, on the walls, this is the part where I'm very grateful to Sarah because she let me paint the walls. <laughs> um, I created these kind of pillars of color and these colors are the sacred colors to the Navajo and they're associated with the four directions as well as the sacred mountains. So I'll kind of go around and introduce you to the mountains <laughs> and um, I'll speak about the QR codes uh, afterwards. But so here, this is the east direction. This is the east direction of the gallery. And it's white because it's for Cisna Jinnah, which is White Shell Mountain. And it's kind of near, um, where is it? Alamosa, Colorado. And this mountain is Tzotzilth, Turquoise Mountain. It's in the south. And the actual mountain shapes that you see uh, inside actually come from the Navajo Seal. So. They're not the outline of the mountain, but they are referencing that. And this is Duco Slead, which is the mountain in the west. It's kind of near Flagstaff, Arizona. And um, this is yellow for Abalone Shell Mountain. And um, I like to think about it as like the yellow of the sunsets. And then over here, we have the north. And the north is Black Jet Mountain. It's Bensa, and um, <laughs> there's actually like a really great story of when me and my family traveled there because um, inside of each mountain that you see are these QR codes 
And the QR codes actually link to 360 videos that I took with my family on the land. Um, we wanted to bring the Dine time travelers to the sacred mountains because they really wanted to go. And so did we. And when we were there, we held up these uh, mirror mylar stencils, these Dine time travelers. Um, and it was me, my mom, my dad, and my brother. And we went to each of the sacred mountains. So we went to Dabensa, Sisna Jene, uh, Zodzil, and Duklo Slead in person. And the QR codes kind of open this, I don't know, this avenue um, where you can kind of be in that space with us that we created. Um, the way I kind of like to think about it is we opened these portals at the sacred mountains, um, these spaces of fluid time energy. And we were visiting with the stories that reside in the land there. Because when you think about it, you know, we think about stories and storytelling, like oftentimes I used to think about it as like really grounded in um, storytellers, like storytellers held those knowledges and elders and knowledge holders. And that's all like super important work in our communities to keep these stories alive. But throughout this work, I started realizing that the land also holds these stories. And the land like lived through these stories. So it was so intimately present, especially when we think about the sacred mountains for the Navajo. Um, you know, the sacred mountains, we often think about it as uh, the Navajo's original Hogan. It is the four mountains that surround our homelands and tell us that we are home. So when we went there, it was really, we were visiting those stories and we were visiting with the land that holds those stories. Um, and then, you know what? I think I'm gonna show you guys one of the uh, QR codes, what it opens up. But quickly before I do that, if we come over here to this part of the gallery, I have another celestial Hogan. And in this one is a QR code that uh, me and my family filmed at our home in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So it's actually, we took the stencils out under the full moon and we danced with them. <laughs> and we kind of opened a portal back um, where I grew up and where I also call home. So that um, portal also lives in this space. But so for the sake of ease, let's pretend that I just scanned that QR code. And then in my handy dandy iPad, <laughs> it popped up on the screen. Um, these are much better viewed over um, like the YouTube app. And we're going to take a little trip. So this is an example of one of the videos. And I hope you can see that okay. But you can see there's my brother. There's one of the Dine time travelers. And there's myself. And this was taken at Debensa, which is the Northern Sacred Mountain. And for this trip, we <laughs> braved a snowstorm. <laughs> and we also braved getting stuck in a ditch. And we had to use a, we had to use chains to get out. It was quite the adventure. Um, but you can kind of see as we go around, oops, sorry, keep that centered. It kind of, the videos create these like lovely portals into the mountains. And I just love seeing it kind of in the space, like inside the celestial Hogan here. And I really have to thank Peter for this because he's the one that like scanned the QR code and then brought it into the Hogan. And I was like, whoa, I got to show that to everybody. <laughs> but okay, so that's kind of 
uh, the general tour of the exhibition, um, kind of talking about the work and some of the stuff that I was thinking about in making it. Um, and now I was gonna just talk a little bit about some of the ideas and theories that really grounded my, my practice over the last two years and during my MFA. Um, I thought it might be kind of fun to share some of the ideas that I've been working with and that I've been developing. So I'm actually gonna switch over. I can say bye to the Celestial Hogan kind of, it'll be in the background. Um, I'm gonna switch over to my computer. So give me a hot sec. I think I can do this. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> can you guys see me? Are we good? Can you hear me? Okay, that was pretty smooth, right? For like all the different tech I'm using. <laughs> um, cool, okay, so now, um, you know, we'll have the Celestial Hogan in the background, but I kind of want to talk a little bit about some of the ideas that I've been exploring. Um, and like, if you had any questions that popped up, like, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'm not monitoring it super closely right now, but um, any questions that pop up, you can like put them in there and we can like talk about them um, once I'm done with this next little part. Um, but yeah, okay, so just to kind of dive right in, because why not? Um, this is an artist talk after all. <laughs> um, one of the like core, I guess, like theoretical backbones in my work has been indigenous futurisms. Um, and for those who I've been talking to in the last couple of years, you know that I'm obsessed with indigenous futurisms um, because it's really allowed me to think really expansively about my cultural teachings, about stories, about creation stories, and about the future um, and about indigenous futures and decolonial futures. And that's been like really transformative for me. So um, just to give a little bit of background, uh, indigenous futurisms is a term that was coined by Grace Dillon, who is Anishinaabe. And it was first coined in 2012 in uh, her book, Walking the Clouds, an anthology of indigenous science fiction. And a lot of people think about it as just like native sci-fi. Um, but I really like to push back against that because science fiction has like, even though I love it, I do, um, you know, there is complexity, <laughs> um, but sci-fi has like really colonial roots. Like um, it dates back to like uh, the industrial revolution and the transatlantic slave trade and like expansion, European expansionism and colonialism. And that's all tied up in there. Um, so when I think about like indigenous futurisms, it's none of that stuff, but it does focus on a lot of the themes that are present in sci-fi, kind of like uh, time travel or alternate realities or, um, you know, space or the cosmos, um, except it's grounded in indigenous stories, worldviews, uh, conceptions of space and time and, for me, it's really been a way that indigenous folks can dream about indigenous futures, can dream about our cultures in the future and what they might look like. Um, and I think that's really powerful for us right now, you know? Um, and whenever I talk about indigenous futurisms, I really <laughs> need, and I always just have to acknowledge that um, it stems from Afrofuturism. And that's really important to acknowledge because um, there's so much that we get from Black communities in our day and age that goes unacknowledged and that is a type of violence. And I think it's really important to, whenever we become aware of that, to try and make the changes necessary to make sure we're acknowledging those communities. Um, but uh, Afrofuturisms, just to give you a little primer on that as well, 
a lot of this info, by the way, that I'm about to share about it is from Crystal Paribu, who is based out of Vancouver. Uh, they are a historian and they did this fantastic YouTube talk um, that, you know, talks about like the history of Afrofuturism and kind of its relevancy in our world today. Um, but Crystal Paribu speaks about Afrofuturism as an aesthetic and theoretical movement that centers Black culture, people, and futures. And it's articulated through various forms of art, music, literature, and thinking. And uh, they talk about Afrofuturism as a movement that is aimed at reimagining futures by Black people, for Black people, and through a Black lens. And it has been a way for generations of Black folks who were violently <laughs> stolen and murdered uh, and displaced from their home communities um, due to the transatlantic slave trade in order to build the Western world. <laughs> um, Afrofuturism has been a way uh, to reconnect to African roots and dream about worlds that are free of enslavement, that are free of white supremacy. And when I think about that history, it's just so important. And it really makes me realize that, you know, Afrofuturism is a radical act of like liberation and freedom. And it's been a portal for generations of Black folks that they've engaged in. And all of that history, like informs Indigenous futurisms. And, um, you know, that history of thought and lineage of thinking, um, is just really important to bring to the forefront because then you really realize it's not just sci-fi. There's an entire history behind it and it's really important to acknowledge that. And you know, um, when I kind of like was listening to this talk and um, Parabu was talking about Afrofuturism as a type of portal, I was like, whoa, like, yeah, indigenous futurisms is also a type of portal. And it's been a portal for me. Um, and it was such a nice moment because I've been really obsessed with portals over the last couple years. Um, I think about them as like windows into other realities, uh, ways of being, um, dream worlds, and also ways of time traveling. Um, they can be used to dream out of white supremacy and into Diné existence. And that's what I need in my life right now. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but just being able to really ground myself in like my Diné identity and story and history has been really rejuvenating for me. Um, and so that's why it was so kind of cool that we went to the sacred mountains with my family. Um, and I really have to do a shout out to them. They're here today because they like went so above and beyond to take me to the sacred mountains. Like they are far apart. <laughs> like we had to take two full weekends in order to travel to all four of the mountains. And um, we braved snowstorms and icy roads and mountain passes that we couldn't get over <laughs> just so that I could do this art project. Um, and like, man, if that's not decolonial love, I don't know what is. But the Hogans that we made on the mountains, um, I like to think, I think of them as Hogans. So I shouldn't just assume you know what I'm talking about. But like, I think about the portals that we made with the Dine time travelers and my family as like Hogans because there's eight, eight sides to a Hogan and in the portals and the, the Hogans on the mountains, like there was four of us as like earth surface people and there were four Dine time travelers. And so we're, we were creating these like spaces of like fluid time energy where we could visit with like our ancestors and with the stories in the land. Um, and this really leads into another core idea in my work, which is the land as time machine. Um, 
this is an idea that I've been developing over the past couple years, and I've talked about it in some previous installations that I've done. Um, but it's really just acknowledging, kind of like I said earlier, that the land holds these knowledges, histories, stories, and like our ancestors. Um, and I started thinking like, huh, like maybe these stories are a way that the land as time machine can actually be activated and can actually travel us through time or maybe time travel our ancestors to us or maybe time travel stories to us. Um, but basically it's a way of creating like this temporal sink where we can visit with one another. And so that's like really core to this work. And um, I've also been using it to think about like, how can we kind of create spaces like this where we can dream future worlds into existence um, and maybe ways that we can time travel to those future worlds and see what they feel like. Um, because I think like, it's one thing to like use your imagination um, to like dream into the future, but I think when you really intentionally think about creating a portal there, you do something a little different and maybe you get to feel what it feels like a little bit. Um, and so that's kind of like what I was thinking about when I was making this work. Um, and another area that's really connected, um, that's helped me think about time differently, which I think you need to think about time differently in order to even think about time travel, um, is this idea of the slipstream. And um, native slipstream is like one of the pillars of indigenous futurisms that Grace Dillon outlined. Um, and to kind of quote, not really quote, paraphrase Grace Dillon, <laughs> Uh, native slipstream, it speaks to time travel, uh, alternate realities and multiverses, and also alternative histories. So really like being able to be like, no, not those colonial, like manipulated histories that just support nation states, like what are indigenous histories and how can we reconnect to those? Um, slipstream views time as pasts, presents and futures that flow together like currents in a navigable stream. So it replicates like nonlinear thinking about space time. And this has been super important when thinking about portals because I don't think portals function with linear time <laughs> or linear thinking. Um, and like maybe time is like a circle or like spiraling or um, layered, you know, like if we can think, if we can break away from this idea that like time just goes in one direction and everything that's past, we can never get back. Like that's just not indigenous thinking. <laughs> so it was really important for me to understand that. Um, and one of the quotes that like really helped me with this was by Leslie Marmon Silko. Um, and I'm going to read you the full quote because it's worth it. And <laughs> it really helped me to think about time differently. So maybe, I don't know, it might kind of spur these ideas for you too. For the old time people, time was not a series of ticks of a clock, one following the other. For the old time people, time was round like a tortilla. Time had specified moments and specific locations so that the beloved ancestors who had passed on were not annihilated by death, but only relocated. All times go on existing side by side for all eternity. No moment is lost or destroyed. There are no future times or past times. There are always all the times, which differ slightly as the locations on the tortilla differ slightly. I love that quote. <laughs> but um, it really just opened up the possibility for me that it is possible to share space with my ancestors and with future ancestors. And it helped me to think about 
um, creation stories and how they can be so like important and like prevalent in our world today. Like it just as a way of like carrying those into this present moment with us. Cause I think before doing this work, I was like, oh yeah, like even as an, a Dine person, I would think about creation stories as stories. And yeah, they tell us how like our world came to be, but there's so much more than that. And I think it took this project for me to really understand that. Um, and this project, you know, along with doing that kind of work, it also really connected me with um, Saint Nagai Baguette Hajon, which is a Dene philosophical matrix. Um, it's kind of, I mean, <laughs> you could take your whole life to try and understand, and it's SNBH for short, so I'll kind of say that, but um, you can kind of take your whole life to really understand SNBH. Um, and it's a very individual type of thing, but there are these kind of core cultural teachings um, that are grounded in the directions. Um, they're grounded in our creation stories. They're grounded on the land. Um, and um, this work has really helped me to kind of reconnect to those kind of Navajo philosophical like roots of how to live a Dene life as a Dene person. Um, and yeah. I think I'm gonna just end with explaining why I chose two sets of siblings as time travelers. Um, you know, I said there was me and my brother and then there's my mom and my auntie, um, these two sets of siblings. And, you know, over the course of this project, I realized that time travel is really messy. <laughs> um, I also realized that I don't think uh, Dene time travelers travel alone. Um, I think that you need a support structure to help you time travel, whether that's uh, your family, your found family, uh, your community. Um, you need some, someone keeping you tethered, keeping you accountable maybe. Um, and so when when I was thinking about siblings, uh, I was thinking about the twins. And uh, the twins were Monster Slayer and Child Born of Water. And they were the sons of Changing Woman from our creation stories. Uh, and I started to think about them as time travelers. And I won't go into our creation stories because you know winter is <laughs> slowly leaving us. But um, in like the early days of our world, the twins uh, went around killing monsters that were plaguing um, the world. And so when I was thinking about time travelers of today and of the future, uh, I realized that we really need the twins um, because there's new monsters that have cropped up and we need to kill them, <laughs> just to put it bluntly. Um, and I think of these monsters as white supremacy, uh, settler colonialism, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, fat phobia, like the list goes on because there's so many ways that people have learned to hate. And I think that for me, that's why I think about time travel is so liberatory because it's kind of a way that we can call on support from like our ancestors or our future ancestors and kind of bring them into like temporal sync is kind of how I like to think about it, like with us so that they can help us slay those monsters because we need to do it. Um, and this is, kind of, this is kind of what I mean when I say, I'm trying to bring these creation stories into my present. Um, and into the future. And um, yeah, just this whole project has really been about reconnecting to my home and the land, uh, to cultural teachings and stories and Dinette aesthetics, um, to my ancestors and maybe future descendants and future ancestors and um, how I can dream, uh, dream about indigenous worlds and how we can set in motion decolonial futures that we can all thrive in. 
So that's my work. <laughs> um, yeah, Oof, I feel like I was talking a long time. Um, questions, anybody want to chat about any ideas? Um, totally open to it. No pressure. <laughs> But yeah. I'm reading the comments, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I know I talked a lot, but <laughs> I don't know. Even if you want to like talk about something that you can make a comment or something. I can also keep talking about stories that happened during my project, but I'd love to, it's just cool to share with you guys because there's so many people I haven't seen in so long. Yeah. We're on We're muting. Okay. Uh, just a few words that the project was beautiful to have in our home. Um, Nicole was designing her, um, not stencils, but uh, her, uh, her pictures, <laughs> projecting them onto the wall and then cutting out the stencils and then transforming the stencils onto the mylar. So it was a beautiful project to witness and to be a part of. And then going to the Forsaken Mountains was really amazing. We had wind storms for the first one and then snow storms and then <laughs> quite a nice weekend going to Flagstaff in that area uh, and coming back through grants so the just visiting the mountains was magical in and of itself let alone doing this amazing project um, and the futurism part is also really of interest because we're, we're trying to create our futurism now when we have to deal with climate change and and we're all gonna to have to participate in that. So having the indigenous voice is so wonderful to use it to inform what we need to do and where we need to go. So mm -hmm. it was such a, a privilege to be able to be a, a part of this. And I, I really thank Nicole for all of the work that she's done. That's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Just as context. <laughs> Thanks dad, yeah. It was really special to go to each of the mountains. Um, feel free to interrupt me if you have a question, do the little handy thing, but I can kind of talk about like when we went to the mountains, um, you know, it was during the pandemic and um, cause like everything's during the pandemic now, <laughs> it's like all consuming. Um, but we have like this RV, so we kind of created like a little bubble so that we could safely travel. And um, yeah, we had to negotiate a lot of work schedules. So we like had this one weekend for the first two mountains and we we're like, we gotta go. And so um, what we didn't realize until like the night before was that this huge snowstorm was passing through. <laughs> And like, you know, this is the Rocky Mountains, like we were going up to Colorado, um, which is where um, the east and the northern mountain are. And, um, you know, we went up the night before and stayed in Alamosa, Colorado at this little RV park. <laughs> and um, we like went to the mountain really early in the morning because in the east um, is the sunrise and you start with dawn. And um, so I wanted to get there at dawn. <laughs> and so my family woke up at like 5 a.m. for me to be able to have enough time to like set this up. And it was the first uh, mountain that we did. And um, we went out on the land and um, there was like a windstorm, like my dad referenced. <laughs> and, you know, these mylar stencils are 
like they're pretty sturdy considering but like the wind just shredded them when we were up there on the mountain and uh you know in the moment I was like keep calm it's okay (laughs) we're gonna get through this it's okay um it reminded me just how powerful the wind is like its own being and um I literally thought my thesis project was doomed and that it was kind of over. I thought that like, that was it. Um, But uh, my dad actually was the one who reminded me that in all the sci-fi shows I love, uh, you know, whenever something breaks like a ship or a time machine, like (laughs) they don't just like abandon it usually. They try and fix it and they repair it and Um, that was like a really important lesson to me. It's like, no, I'm not going to give up on this. Um, I'm going to repair it. And so my dad stayed up late that night with me um, repairing the stencils. And like we taped them up with like clear tapes. You can't actually see it very well, but um, it's just so that we could keep going. And the next morning was the Northern Mountain where... um, we encountered that lovely snowstorm, which I showed you in the 360 video. But yeah. Oh, I see a little question. Um, Could you talk a little bit about how the work at Open Space in Victoria led you to this development of it, i.e. the choice of materials, how the precursor Mylar installations changed in any way? It's actually like such a good question. So the piece that I did in Victoria was for a show curated by Eli Hurdle, who is here. Hi, Eli. (laughs) And um, that show is called Landback. And uh, for that show, I created a a transporter pad, like from Star Trek, but like a Navajo version. And um, for that piece, I was really thinking about time traveling land protectors. Um, So like the context of that show, um, like when Eli first approached me about it was like last year in like February when um, it was just that that, like really peaking moment of uh, actions that were taking place across Canada and the world to support um, the Wet'suwet'en and um, so it was just kind of like at this moment in time where I was like, whoa, we really need time traveling land protectors who kind of like this idea of like ancestors who can travel and like support us in dreaming about like decolonial futures. It was this kind of like the first way I thought about it was like time traveling land protectors who um, can come and support folks who are doing that work on the front lines. Um, And so the piece was kind of about creating a portal about one of my ancestors, Ansa Anelli, who um, I think about as like a Navajo um, matriarch and land protector who was alive during the long walk. Um, And she was uh, stolen from my home community and um, under the captivity of the US government in the 1860s. I think, and uh, she actually escaped and was able to travel back home. Um, And she became this like really powerful leader and um, person in our community who really protected our community. And so just like thinking about like her story and thinking about people in history who kind of, did land protection work, but maybe in a slightly different way or context, um, how we can kind of call on them when we need them to. Um, And uh, I think that also like, if I think about the materials of that work, um, I kind of also did this like wooden structure. I don't think I have a picture of it, sadly, (laughs) but uh, I like created this like wooden um, structure that held these panels Uh, So it was like a smaller version of this that was uh, on a wall. And so when you stepped into it, the mylar completely surrounded you. Um, And there was really vibrant, bright light. So it was like constantly glittering off of you. Um, And in that piece, um, 
at the base of the transporter, I actually used um, uh, the earth from my home community, Round Rock, Arizona. And my uh, cousin Sam actually went with me uh, to um, harvest that sand for the installation. Um, and I didn't do that for this piece because it's massive <laughs> and it's a pandemic and it's hard to get things around. <laughs> but I think that ideally, like I really like to kind of bring, I like to bring the land into the gallery when possible because I think it adds this other kind of transformation uh, that's really, I don't know, I just feel like it's important in this work. So, yeah. Any other ideas? There's our comments, questions. There's about five minutes left. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, instead of taking time to write this, Nicole, I'm just going to ask you. I I'm, I'm don't know if this will make sense, but I'm, it's because it's just coming in my brain as I'm saying it. Um, <laughs> um, I'm wondering, you know, you've mentioned the pandemic a few times, and I I think this work was probably I feel it's very grounded in our ceremonies. I, I know you mentioned Black futurism, but I feel like we have a futurism too. Um, and it's really based in our ceremonies that our ancestors did and have always done and and the portals exist in our ceremonial spaces and in our dances and our songs and I'm wondering though how the pandemic itself may have um, benefited the work and your approach to it you, can you think of any ways that the pandemic and the the way that life is right now has been or how you've actually turned that into a strength at this time yeah um that's actually an awesome question because the only reason i did 360 videos at all um was because of the pandemic um i was actually trying to think about ways that i could transform my practice of installation into a virtual setting um and i actually like last fall i didn't think i was gonna have an exhibition um i thought that to finish off my mfa the only way that i could show my work would be online and so because of that uh challenge i had to really push my brain <laughs> to think of ways where i could think about installation in a digital way um which like, what? That doesn't seem to compute, but my solution was 360 videos. And um, those videos, like I, my parents helped me invest in getting like a really nice 360 camera so that um, we could actually do this project. You know, this project wouldn't have even happened if the pandemic didn't happen. Um, cause I never would have thought about 360 videos and like, I didn't even think about this until like a couple months ago. <laughs> so like, you know, the whole process has just been really kind of responsive to like our reality right now. So yeah, definitely the pandemic totally shaped my entire experience. Um, and, uh, I think, I don't know if you guys all know, but, um, in the, uh, in your like confirmation email for this talk, um, I put in a link to a YouTube playlist so you can see all of the videos. You can see all five. So if you want to cruise back through your emails, um, you can watch all of them. Um, and they're really nice on like a mobile device or like a phone um, with like the YouTube app because that's how you can kind of do that like you can like look around with with the work. Um, yeah, but you can also look at it on your computers. So like you would just use your cursor to drag the screen around. So um, whatever way works best. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Eli. Eli posted a link 
two photos from the open space show if you guys want to check it out. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, unless there's any last minute questions, I'll pause for five seconds. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Carrie? I think you're muted there. Oh, any future projects in the making? Um, <laughs> not yet, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have some other gigs that aren't, they're not exactly related to my installation work, um, like possible like illustration uh, projects coming up which is really exciting. <laughs> and also some uh, murals that I'll be doing in Victoria, actually. So folks, I'm coming to Victoria for the summer. <laughs> um, and yeah, I got my first vaccine dose yesterday. So I'm feeling a lot safer about traveling across the country because I'm gonna have to drive, so. Um, and then I am planning on doing um, the Navajo Cultural Arts Program in, um, on my home res in the fall. So this work has really showed me that um, the amount that I've learned is like a minuscule drop <laughs> in this like vast ocean of knowledge that my community holds. And uh, I just really wanna keep on that journey. So I'm planning on going home and doing that program for a year. And then who knows what I'll do after that. <laughs> so yeah. But if there aren't any, are there any other last questions right before we finish up? It's been really fun to kind of share this with you guys. So thanks, Sue. What happens to the portals uh, when you're done with the show? What are you gonna do with them? Oh, hi, Libby. <laughs> um, oh, this is such a good question. I don't, I think they're gonna live in Victoria. I mean, not Victoria, they're gonna live in Toronto for a little bit. Um, it's definitely like the hardest part about like packing up the Dinah time travelers because I feel like they have like, been infused with this energy from the land and from the work that we did. Um, so I don't think I can keep them packed up for too long. Um, I am hoping to tour the show. So I'm gonna figure out how to write exhibition proposals <laughs> and I'm gonna do that. Um, so maybe it'll be coming to a place near you. <laughs> oh man, I'm such a dork, okay. <laughs> Aw, thanks you guys. I think we'll kind of wrap it up there. That feels good. I think that feels good. I hope you guys all enjoyed spending time with me for an hour and getting to meet the sacred mountains and the Dana time travelers. Um, it's just been really nice just talking about it like in one go, you know? So thanks for tuning in. Um, Thank you, Nicole, and congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. OK. Bye, guys. It's so nice seeing all your faces. <laughs> Aww, thanks, Heidi, Matt, and Emily, right? Oh, I'm so glad you guys came. <laughs> Aww, bye, Melody. <laughs> bye. Bye, Michelle. Bye, Walter. Bye, Lynn. Yay. Thank you, Nicole. Bye, Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, Nicole. Bye, Sue. <laughs> oh. Good job. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, take care until Monday. Yeah, gotta wish me luck. <laughs>